this round, hopefully, or not. There we are. Um, so I work for the National STEM Learning Centre. Uh, I'm their online CPD coordinator. The centre actually provides training. Well, it's not training. It's, de it's professional development for teachers, ongoing professional development for teachers in a, in a whole range of different ways, and our centre in York, but also nationally across many of our partners. And I've come from the University of York uh, with a fair bit of experience in doing e-learning and a bit of distance learning. And I started doing MOOCs uh, for teachers' professional development. And I had to throw everything I knew out the window. <laughs> it was a bit of a, an enlightening moment for me. And so I had to reconsider everything I thought I knew about how distance learning works. So I apologise if, if what I show you now is unsurprising to you as experienced open educators. Uh, but I thought I'd share my uh, experiences for you. In this presentation, I'll be drawing upon engagement data, and this is quantitative data, uh, from five different types of courses that we offer to explore the design issues that we might need to consider when developing MOOCs. But more crucially, of course, is how to best equip our online learners to utilise our courses and our content. So when we put a course or any open resource together, normally as educators, we want our learners to progress through it. We may say that we're happy for them to dip out here and there, but the reality is we want them to complete it all, don't we? Um, we've put a lot of thought into that learning design, the idea of the narrative flow through the course, uh, the idea that we're trying to help them develop a particular skill, and that's not just something you can get from just visiting one page. There's a sequence of activities involved here. So how do we judge whether a course is working or not? Well, we normally draw on a pretty graph like this, and in this case it's a retention curve, a uh, attrition curve uh, for a course, um, and it gives us an idea of how learners are progressing through it. And retention is, is one of those metrics that's very easy to measure and gives us a sense that how learners are progressing through a course. But those statistics aren't as helpful as we might originally think. Now, De Boer and colleagues challenge the use of these sorts of metrics, the metrics that we apply to our normal sorts of courses, and we can call them normal, but online distance, uh, formal education, and caution about the application to MOOCs, they talk of uh, an informed com a commitment to complete. And that's about considering whether the, the people who join these courses are actually intending to complete it. So there appears to be first a useful concept that simply the inflated enrolment figures that we hear about MOOCs uh, actually describe the commitment to start uh, and not very useful. But the retention curve starts to introduce a few other ideas. So De Boer proposed that we are looking at ways to measure informed commitment to complete. Perhaps watching the first video is, shows that. Maybe completing the first week or completing an activity. You could decide at any point where that commitment to complete is going to come in. So for the purposes of this presentation, I've just said, well, if you access any page on the course, you've made a commitment in some way. And that's why these graphs um, are represented here as a percentage of all the learners. And why, importantly, even the first step doesn't have all the learners there. Some learners will just dive in later. And I thought, well, maybe that's something that's typical of MOOCs and down to the individual motivations of learners. And again, to Bowen colleagues make the astute point that because of the open nature of MOOCs, Learners have the opportunity to address their own educational needs. Again, no surprise there. For example, Watted and Barrack, in a study of one MOOC, made the observation that participants from industry or professions are likely to enrol on courses for professional gain, i.e. addressing a particular skills gap or knowledge gap, rather than to get a piece of paper. And that's really important to me. If I'm developing resources for teachers and their CPD, and not necessarily creating courses for them to come away with a piece of paper. So we have learners with learning goals that might not align with other students, and it might not even align with the educator, perhaps. And De Boer and colleagues describe this as the window shopping of open online courses, a characteristic which again comes through on the retention graphs. However, I'm not convinced that that window shopping activity is actually taking place across the whole course. So if you filter just those learners who view less than a quarter of the course, which is the blue line here, you see that most of their interest still is only at the very start. Not much is happening along the rest of the course. The start of the course is still the focal point for these types of learner. Learners who access more than 75% of the course have a more even distribution, which is what you'd expect. 
So there's something going on at the very start of the course that's informing learners' decisions to either engage or not. And I think that's something that we need to pay attention to as MOOC designers. Now, it wasn't until a change in the way that courses were advertised on FutureLearn, many of you might be aware of, uh, that I decided to start considering the significance of course start dates. And I got quite upset, someone who's come from online distance education, about the idea that the course start date is no longer really advertised. The idea of the course as an event is being challenged. And those that uh, see a course on FutureLearn might not know when the course actually started, when they join. So... There's a, there's a bit of a tension there when you look at uh, the typical model of a student thinking they're going to do a course but might be arriving late. Now, Ferguson and the Clouds' use of investigation of engagement over time on a number of MOOCs provides part of the rationale for this. Patterns of behaviour were categorised with one category, samplers, uh, being particularly common amongst late starters. The concern for late starters is the course structure with its weekly pattern might actually discourage participation by late arrivals leading them to become samplers rather than completers. So the new future learn approach is actually quite clever if you think about the weeks are now adjusted to when the learner starts. So if the course is four weeks in, a new learner joins, to them it's still week one, and they get all the week one emails and things like that. So they think it's still at the beginning of the course. But I still wanted to explore whether there was a difference in learning experience for those who signed up in advance compared to those who join when the course is already running, or even supported periods in what has been known unsupported periods and what has been known as extended availability without facilitating involvement. So this graph starts to show how two groups, those enrolled before the course and after the course, visited the course pages. This is the retention graph, but split out into those two groups. Now, this was a course with an advertised start date. Immediately you see a difference that those enrolled after the start date, the blue line, sorry, the orange line, drop off at a much higher attrition rate than those who joined and enrolled the course before the start of the course itself. So if we go back to the idea of window shopping, this seems to suggest to me that learners who have an immediate access to the course are not browsing the whole course for relevant bits, but using the first few pages to work out whether it beats their learning, uh, rather than perhaps looking at the course uh, content um, in more detail, and just dipping in. Those who make a conscious decision before the course start date have read the course blurb, they're more committed they have a better understanding where the course fits their need. The pattern is exactly the same when you look at the new model of course promotion from your future loan without the start date being advertised. The number of enrolments before the course is lower, but the shape of the curve is exactly the same. So I've also adjusted it. So I've changed the curve so they're now reflecting the proportion of those different enrollment period groups. And this was a pattern that I found, quite surprisingly, in all of our courses, whether it was a six-week subject specialist course or a two-week course for volunteers who go out to work in schools and talk about STEM. So why are we allowing instant access if the learners don't see the course out? Unsurprisingly, the conversion to learner, the enrolment to access, is high even though the proportion remained retained for the full duration of the course is lower. Is this down to the course design? The focus is more on a collaborating cohort, or is this down to the nature of the individual learner who is more targeted at which point the course is going to look at, once they've committed before that first week? So the course is free, and in order to get informed commitment to complete, why not jump in straight away? My guess would be that the course title alone does prompt this engagement. So we need to do some work here on how we keep those learners engaged. We have here that conversion to learner graph. And you can see that the before start date is significantly lower than those who jump in when the course is available. You've got that instant gratification when the course is available. So there for you to engage straight away. Again, not surprising. But aside from whether late learners join before working out whether the course is right for them or not, there are other issues at play. And Swinnerton and colleagues reported that commenters, those learners who make posts, who contribute, are more likely to have online courses before, uh, more likely to have taken online courses before, in a sense that they've brought um, some experience to that, that engagement. So when we look at the way that different groups of learners have started to comment, it's quite interesting to see that those who joined before the course has started, those who perhaps might have done online courses before and are aware of how the online courses work, they've engaged with that type of learning, some assumptions in there, are definitely more likely to be actively contributing. And again, we have that 
problem of whether you've got a load of people all joining together, there's a bit of a buzz going. And if you're coming in late, you're going to get perhaps a less of an experience. But is that actually the case? You can still learn vicariously from the experience shared by learners who may have posted several weeks ago and are now long gone. So whether these late starters have prior experience or not, we're asking them to engage with the course in a very different way. And the same is true of whether they're social learners, whether they reply to other learners. So our design challenge is therefore how can we make the course flexible, open to those with different learning needs at different times, whilst also aiming to provide support and deliver the benefits and richness of social learning, particularly as we're having more and more people join the course late. Now, we've tried a few approaches in our courses. The way that these later learners are learning is different, but not necessarily less valuable. We still receive positive feedback about the impact of the course on their practice. And we incorporate a mixture of design elements to help respond to a growing number of learners without trying to take the course without our educator support. And that educator support is actually something we value quite a lot, having our academic expertise and our professional development expertise to help our participants. So we've tried a few things out. I'm still not sure which of these is the most valuable for those late starters. I'd be very keen to hear your thoughts and if you've, if you've explored this issue yourself, how we make sure that late starters get the most out of the course. But one way I wanted to consider what is happening in an online course is to use the student-teacher content interaction model. And certainly this has informed my thinking. Myzo and Addison applied that student content teacher interaction models three classic MOOC categories of X, C, and S, with content being more significant X and interaction with other learners and educators being more, more applicable in the connectivist, constructivist, or social formats. Bain and Ross, in the 2014 review of MOOCs in the UK, came to the conclusion that there are many different types of MOOCs out there, and that definition of X and C just is completely irrelevant. And I would argue a similar but slightly different point. Because from what I've shown, I've come to the conclusion that MOOCs are metamorphic, and that might be a bit of a contrived alliteration there. But MOOCs don't just have one format or one mode of learning or teaching, as the design designer intended. What is happening within certain online courses, and certainly these courses which have extended enrolment, extended availability periods without support, is the very nature of the MOOC itself changes. The levels of potential interaction are different. Learners and possibly thinking, is the course facilitating team still available? Have I missed the date for any time-based activities? Are there learners making comments? Is anyone actually going to read my contributions? Now, I'm not sure whether all these questions actually go through the heads of MOOC learners, but if our courses are designed to encourage interaction in some way, then our courses not only have to be flexible for different forms of participation, for different learning aims, flexible enough that they work in both transmissive and collaborative pedagogies. Dare I say it then, is MOOC pedagogy itself open open to interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, um, and the very provocative, uh, thought-provoking ending. Um, let's take a question from the back first. Hi, um, I'm Doug Belshaw. Matt, that was really interesting. So I'm interested in, and this might sound uh, like a facetious question, but why do we even do courses? Like, why don't we start from where people are with granular content and then give them a bunch of pathways, and then it doesn't matter where they start and stuff. I'm just interested in why we persist in courses where we don't necessarily do that offline sometimes. I think that's a very valid point, and I think that's why I was sort of suggesting that maybe course structure is something that we as educators put in, because that helps us order our thinking. And we have that picture in our head of where a learner needs to go through certain key points in order to build their development. We have in our courses um, a self-audit task where learners identify the points that, or, or, or against 10 statements of the things they want to address in the course, and they have to identify what their professional development objective is at the start of the course. And I think that's actually an incredibly valuable experience for them to do, because whether you're joining the course with all the other learners at the beginning, or if you're joining it late, you can still do that activity to help you direct what you want to get out of the course. So I think there's a scaffolding structure there that we put in as educators, but how people engage with MOOCs is certainly up to them. Um, and I think that's one of the tensions I'm still trying to grapple with. Okay, another question from the front here.
Hi. Uh, have you considered uh, giving participants alternatives, like downloading the entire course and doing it offline at their own pace, or including uh, themes of gamification, like uh, achievements and accomplishments? Yeah, it's an interesting point, and that's not something that we've looked at so far. Um, I'd be interested to, to hear a little bit more about gamification in the professional educational sphere. That that was that could actually be quite interesting to look at, but I don't know how much is out there on that. Um, in terms of downloading content, well, all the videos are downloadable, but FutureLearn, as you know, has got a cutoff now unless you pay to upgrade, and I think that is an issue. But we include within our courses certain takeaways. So there are handouts and things that they, they will take on. Um, we have a lot of online resources that we link to on our own website, um, which are freely available and are open. So, uh, uh, yes, I think that's a very valid point to consider, is, is the portability of the course content and how um, the participants can return to it. Because within professional development, actually, that's incredibly important, is being able to go back um, and change and review your thinking over a longer period of time. Um, which is actually probably why we see quite a number of participants take our courses multiple times. Um, they don't. They, they might get a little bit out of the, the first run and a little bit out of the second run, but they do come back, which is very interesting to, to think about. Thank you. Question from the middle here. Hi, uh, thanks. That was gr great, and I love your alliteration. I've already <laughs> gone off and stolen it. Oh, you are Creative <laughs> Commons, whatever. Um, and to fo so, hi, I'm Andrew Smith from the Open University. Um, with MOOCs, do you think there's a mythology there? Do you think actually students know that they're doing a MOOC? No, we don't use the word MOOC anywhere. Yeah, I think MOOCs. yeah, I've often kind. Of, they're, they're doing an online course, they're yeah. engaging online, but as soon as you start telling them it's a MOOC or anything yeah. like that, um, you may as well start beating your chest and speaking Klingon at them because yeah. it's, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, a, it's pointless, it's a strange language, it's, yeah, yeah, whatever. But it's interesting, your data for your MOOC, because I've been engaging something quite different in a completely different community, and there's a few percent out, but we're more, it's behaving more or less the same. And I'm teaching teachers network engineering. So whatever you're teaching is behaving the same way. And in my community, where I'm using a completely different platform, the data is very yeah. similar. So is this another thing about human nature? I, I couldn't possibly answer that very uh, yeah. high-level question, but um, I, I think that, that there is, certainly we've looked at retention data across a number of different partners, and it comes out very similar, um, and our, ours seem to be noticeably higher, because we must be doing something right, and I think it's that, uh, that, that extra design elements that we put in which keep that retention going better. Um, but the consistency of the shape of the curves in the difference between those two groups, between all of the different courses that we ran, was the thing that surprised me the most. Because yes, you can look at retention across every learner, but those learners are divided in so many different groupings. And Future Learner has just done some work on archetypes, where they're looking at um, learners who are doing it for professional reasons versus those who are just doing it for the weekend as a hobby, and the different behaviours that are exhibited by those two different types of learners. So we can start to break that down in many different ways, but I think that overall picture is, is the long tail. It's the long tail that we've been talking about for years now in terms of the way the internet's used and the resources that are out there. Everyone's looking for a niche, and that, that might be some, you know, a couple of steps might, might, might be addressing their niche. Mm. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to have to stop you there, but thank you very much. Cheers.